the infernos, and all of a sudden we were sitting in classrooms doing the radiation training thing of what we should have been doing before this ever happened. The radiation level, or exposure, permissible exposure level at that time to save property was 25R, we could receive a dose of 25R, and to save proper, or life, it was 100R. That's pretty high, that's pretty high. But to save that that much, we knew we could, we could have. But beyond that, no. Uh, another quick thing, when we m made that trip into where I showed you the, went up to where that reader, uh, instrument reading pegged. Oh, there's something wrong with this. We've got to do something about this. We've got to do, we've got to check this. There's something wrong with this instrument. Get that out there and get me another instrument. <laughs> Brought it back. Turn it on. Now he's, now the assistant chief's in the control room. Turn it back on. <laughs> right up there, same place, boink. Oh, hmm, maybe it isn't the instrument. See, see how things change. We did have two instruments. Now, what do they got? A thousand R instruments now? I got two of my fireman buddies right here and tell me now they're carrying thousand R instruments. We didn't have anything like that then. And so when it pegs, you should have get out of there anyway. Where did, where did that peg? 20, 25 R per hour? Yeah, just an Yeah. <coughs> This year? Uh-huh. When you were when you were walking up the steps, where did it pay? Oh. Okay. And we'll show you right where it pegged. We're getting there. Okay. At this point right here. It pegged at two hundred R and that was the maximum reading. Now, you scientists and so forth, you're way beyond me. But I know that, what is it? One fourth the distance, four times the reading, some figure like that. Okay, if you go to here, you can imagine what it is. And if you go to here, you can imagine what it is. How would we know? The instrument is already saying, dummy, I can't read anymore. I, that's as much as I can read. And so once you get up there, what was the reading level? I can't tell you. But I know it would have had to be not. We still had to sell the instrument. I don't know why. It didn't say anything, but it still had the instrument. But it, it didn't, didn't tell you what the reading was going in there. So here we are, blind sheep following the leader, you know, so to speak. Okay, any other questions I got? You said you went out twice and had false alarms. Whatever caused them? Okay. They were truly fault, well, malfunctioning alarms. Let me put it that way. They, they weren't false. That was saying something, but it was a malfunction of equipment. Now, when we went out there, the, the people that met us, they, they helped us out to find where the location was. But back shift, by the time 9 o'clock gets here, and they're gone. There's no, nobody there. So they weren't in any way related to the, the accident other than location? No. Up in the top of this, up in the top of this area, right here, is probably four or five heat <coughs> detectors up there. There was. There's gone now. There was. And what they were was a detector that detects a rate of rise temperature. But when it gets to a certain point, it alarms anyway. But if say it's 70 degrees in this room, and all of a sudden it's up to 160 degrees, that detector says, I got a flash fire going on here, or a fire, and I go into the alarm condition. Now that's the type of detectors that was up on this 
this floor. Okay, so when that reactor went boom, immediately that temperature went way up here. That detector says, oh, hey, I got a fire. That was the detectors that was alarming when the thing went off. It wasn't the f f anywhere else. But unfortunately, everything was combined into one alarm, so you didn't know what it was. So you just had to look around. We're in this building, and we got alarm from here, but then firemen have to go looking around. Another thing that happened after that, one moment, after that, these simple alarm cards were updated to tell you a little bit more about where you might find a nuclear problem. They were up, they updated them. They, they learned the hard way that you gotta make things better. And so they updated them. Uh, they even went to different ways of, of, with computers now and everything. They can tell exactly what room they're in and so forth. So they know what the problem is or so forth. But here, back in its infancy, that's all you knew. It was in the office or reactor. That's all you knew. And so you t had to take time, unless you see into something burning, but if you had to investigate, it took you time, but at least you, you knew it had to be somewhere in this building right here. Okay. Okay, I'll walk down here. Where did they bury the victims? Okay. What happened to the other guys that responded uh, to that night? Any of them still around? Okay. I've got two questions. I can answer one. I can answer <coughs> one. First off, the six of us involved that night, the question was, what about the guys that responded that night? There were six of us involved. As far as I know, there's two left myself and one other guy. Maybe there's three, I don't know, but two of us left. The assistant chief, who I followed around, he died at 96 years old. So did the radiation get him? I'm not sure about that. <laughs> he also liked the, he also liked that pretty well. And, and that was, that was uh, the way he, he lived. He liked that. Now your question? Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, the victims, this gentleman right here could tell me more than, tell you more than I can tell you, but from what I've been told, they, after they got the victims out, they took them to the chemical processing plant and they stored them there, put them in tanks for a bit, and then they did uh, autopsies on them. And then they, uh, uh, when they're through with that, they ordered three extra large coffins, and this is what I've been told now, folks. This time it's not hearsay, from, it's hearsay, but not on the scene. They took and lead lined these caskets, and then they, two of them, I understand, went to Arlington National Cemetery for burial, because they're military people, and the one went to his hometown. Now, the HP who I talked to told me that he escorted the body back and he said that they par poured a cement slab in the bottom of the grave, but the people have the, the uh, services so they, they could pay respects and say goodbye to the people. And then after they left, they put the lead line casket in and they tell me it took a lift type device. Now you couldn't, six people didn't pick it up. But they put it down in the grave, entombed it with concrete, and then this HP, who was escorted back from what I understand, took a survey around, could not find any trace of any radiation coming out of it. They filled the rest up with dirt and put a marker on it and that was it. So that's where, that's what happened to them. Here. I have a question. I'd like to make a comment. Uh, about okay, I'll come back. Exposure I'll records. I'd just like to make a comment to the crowd about radiation exposure records associated with SL1. 
Uh, Lynn and I are involved with the EEI and CPA um, effort, and I've been involved in radiation exposure records for decades. Um, the records associated with the people involved with SL1 reflect the exposures they got. I can't speak to Egan's because I don't remember what his uh, what the situation is. I'm not looking at his records, but um, but other people that I have looked at reflect the big doses that they got. So the records are accurate. Um, and I can't speak to his, but in about an hour I will be able to.